Greetings. There are so many ways to talk about human dignity, and many of those conversations are wrapped up in issues of power. Who has it, how they choose to wield it, and who lacks it. And often that power can switch hands very quickly, depending on the situation that we're in. What we're going to do today is look at a story about how that power is played out through what the rabbis call shamta. In Aramaic, that means shunning or excommunication or ostracism. There's not an exact English translation for it. I think it's safe to say that many of us have been in a situation where we have either been shunned or where we have participated in shunning someone else. Either it might have been in elementary school or in high school or even as an adult, but it has profound effects on our own sense of dignity. The story that we're gonna look at appears in the Babylonian Talmud after a series of stories that are all about shunning. Who gets to do it? Who doesn't get to do it? When they get to do it? And even when individuals impose it on themselves. I actually wanna begin at the very end of the text where the rabbis finally ask the question, my shamta, what is shamta? What does the word shamta actually mean? In other words, why is it called Shanta? So the text asks, my Shanta, what is Shanta? Rav says, Sham Mita. So Rav does a play on the words, Shanta, splits the word up and says it means Sham, there, Mita, death. There is death. And Shmuel says, Shmuel also does a play on the words, Shemama Tihie. It shall be a shmama, a desolation. And it has an effect upon him like fat lining an oven, the Gemara continues to say. So what is like fat lining an oven? Well, Rashi explains, Rashi is an 11th century uh, commentator. So Rashi explains like fat with which they line an oven, which is absorbed into the oven and never comes out. That is to say, goes on Rashi, it is a trauma, literally a blow, for anyone on whom they place a shanta, for it never leaves them. I began here so that as we read through the narrative, that gravity is fully felt. I want to think about the ways in which the text speaks to some of the ethical issues of our time. Most particularly, it speaks to an ethos of extrajudicial public shaming and shunning, and an atmosphere in which institutions and communities sacrifice individuals in order to protect the standing of the institution or of their own leadership, or both, in the eyes of their constituents. So let's begin with the story. There was a certain rabbinical student about whom there were damaging rumors. It's commonly translated as he had a bad reputation. So that first line is already extremely open-ended, primarily through what it leaves unsaid. For example, where did this bad reputation come from? What did it concern? Who spread the word? Why did they spread the word? Was it based on fact or fabrication or a little of both? But we're not given any more information than that. The next thing that we hear is about Rav Yehuda, who's the head of one of the primary academies in Babylonia. And Rav Yehuda says, what shall we do? We cannot place a shamta on him because the rabbis need him. But if we do not place a shamta on him, it will defile the name of God. So Rav Yehuda has already accepted that these rumors are true, or at least that the community has accepted that the rumors are true. But that places him in a predicament. This young scholar is somehow serving the community. So if he puts a shanta on him, that service will not be available. But assuming the rumors are true, doing nothing would defile the name of God. So Rava says to Rabba Bar Barchana, his colleague, have you heard anything regarding this? Now here's where the story gets a little muddy because Rabbi Barbarchana's answer to Rav Yehuda can be understood in a 
on, in several different ways. So Rabbi Bar Barchana answers, Rabbi Yochanan said this. So already Rabbi Bar Barchana is deflecting, right? This isn't his own opinion. He's just quoting Rabbi Yochanan. And here's what Rabbi Yochanan says. What is the meaning of the verse, for the lips of the priest shall guard knowledge and they shall seek Torah from his mouth, for he is a messenger of God. So Rabbi Yochanan quotes Malachi, a prophet, and explains him. If a rabbi is similar to a messenger of God, they will seek Torah from his mouth. And if not, they will not seek Torah from his mouth. Now, I think you'll agree with me that this is a very cryptic answer to a very straightforward question. So let's just go through it for a second. So we've got the verse from the prophet Malachi, for the lips of the priest shall guard knowledge and they shall seek Torah from his mouth, for he is a messenger of God. So the verse tells us on the, on the, on the surface of it, that the priest who is like a messenger of God is supposed to guard knowledge so that others will come and learn Torah from him. So that others presumably believe him or trust him. Um, and Rabbi Yochanan equates the priest with the rabbi. And he explains that the verse means that a rabbi should be like a messenger of God so that people learn Torah from him. But why is Rabbi Bar Barchana quoting Rabbi Yochanan on this? And who is Rabbi Bar Barchana talking about? So there are two possible readings of this. Is he saying to Rav Yehuda that this rabbinical student is not acting like a messenger of God? And so nobody is going to come learn Torah from him anyway. So don't worry about the community needing him because nobody's going to come. Or is Rabbi Bar Barchana saying, that he himself, Rabbi Bar Barchana, needs to be like a messenger of God and to guard knowledge. In other words, to keep quiet and not answer Rav Yehuda. Because if he does tell Rav Yehuda what he knows, nobody's going to come learn Torah from him. In other words, is Rabbi Bar Barchana using the verse to tacitly admonish Rav Yehuda for his question? Is he saying, Rav Yehuda, if I want my colleagues to come seek Torah from my mouth, I need to be a messenger of God to guard knowledge and not to engage in rumors. Whatever he actually means, Rav Yehuda thinks that Bar Bar Chana is talking about his rabbinical student, because the next thing that we hear is that Rav Yehuda exercises his power and puts a shamta on the student. And then we go on to the next scene. The next scene goes like this. After some time, Rav Yehuda grew ill. The rabbis came to inquire after him or to visit him. And he, the student who Rav Yehuda had excommunicated, came with them. When Rav Yehuda saw him, he laughed. The student said to Rav Yehuda, isn't it enough that you excommunicated me? You also have to laugh at me? Rav Yehuda said to the student, I'm not laughing at you. Rather, when I die, I will rejoice that I did not favor a man like you. The next thing that the Talmud tells us is Rav Yehuda died. Now, this puts the student in a very bad position because the way that Shamta works is that the only person who can release someone from a Shamta is the person who put them there to begin with or someone of equal status. So when we go to the next scene, that student is in hot water. The Talmud tells us, the student came to the Beit Midrash. He said to them, release me. The rabbi said to him, there's no man as important as Rav Yehuda that can release you. So go to, Ravi, to Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya so that he may release you. Now, Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya is the patriarch not in Babylonia, but in the land of Israel. But the story tells us that this student goes to Rabbi Yehuda Nesia to get released from this Shabda. And what does Rabbi Yehuda Nesia do? The Talmud tells us, he said to Rabbi Ami, his junior, 
go and investigate this case. If we should release him, release him. And the story continues. Rabbi Ami investigated his case and concluded that they should release him. So Rabbi Ami investigates the case and for whatever reason, after having investigated the facts, decides that this student should not be under Shabta. And he goes to the Beit Midrash and presumably he announces this and releases the student from Rav Yehuda's Shamta as his superior, Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya, who is the patriarch, he's the highest level in the, in the Jewish community. So the patriarch has told him, if you see that the facts are that he should be released, release him. And here is where we begin to learn about how status impacts justice and ultimately impacts human dignity. So the Talmud continues, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani stood on his feet and said, if the rabbis did not make light of an excommunication enacted for three years by Rebbe's servant woman, how much more so should we uphold a shanta enacted by our colleague, Rav Yehuda? Now, what you need to know here is that there is another story in which a maidservant of Rabbi Yehuda, the prince, who is just called Rebbe, puts a shamta on someone that holds for three years. So Rav, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, with no facts and having done no investigation, stands up for dramatic effect and objects vociferously to the idea of removing the shamta based not on conflicting evidence, but on an appeal to honor the deceased Rav Yehuda who enacted the Shamta. If a servant, and not only a servant, but a woman puts a Shamta on someone that lasts three years, then a Shamta by Rav Yehuda, who's the head of the Pumbedetan Yeshiva, shouldn't be removed. And then the scene gets even more dramatic. When another rabbi, Rabbi Zera points to the rabbi who just spoke, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, and says to the other rabbis, observe what is before us, that today this elder, Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, has come to the Beit Midrash. For how many years has it been that he has not come? So Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, the first speaker, is so old and frail apparently that he hasn't come to the Beit Midrash for years, but he's gotten himself out of bed and hobbled to the Beit Midrash just to defend the honor of Rav Yehuda by insisting that Rav Yehuda's Shamta not be released. And what Rabbi Zera says, he ends on his impassioned speech by saying, what should we learn from this? That we should not release him. So Rabbi Zera, endorses Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani's objection to lifting the Shamta out of respect for Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani. And again, Rabbi Zera doesn't point to any facts or any investigation that he has done about this case. But just for the sake of honoring Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani, who points to honoring Rav Yehuda, just for that sake, for the honor of those two men, these rabbis argue that there should, there should not be a release of the Shanta for, for this student. Okay, so on the one side, we've got Rabbi Ami having investigated the actual case and come to the conclusion that the Shanta should be lifted. And on the other hand, we've got these rabbis who've done no investigation and are explicitly invoking honor as their own rationale for upholding the Shanta. And what do we think happens? The Talmud continues, they did not release him. He left in tears. So although Rabbi Ami's investigation supported an end to the Shamta, the decision is reversed in deference to these elders and the Shan scholar leaves the Beit Midrash in tears. What happens next? In the next scene, the Talmud tells us, a hornet came and stung the student on his penis and he died. Although the opening of the story provides no details about the scholar's tarnished reputation, this bizarre cause of death suggests that the narrator is pointing to some sort of a sexual transgression. 
our minds might immediately go to cases like those that have thankfully gotten a lot of attention this past year as a result of the Me Too movement. But the text actually gives no indication of a victim or an aggrieved party. And harassment isn't in fact a transgression in the rabbinic mind. So what transgressions might these rumors have been about? Well, possibly a um, reputation of having engaged in sex with another man, in sex with a woman who practiced idolatry, in sex with a consenting available woman, if she was single and not married to him, or even having excluded himself, having secluded himself with another woman, those would all be deserving of rabbinic censure, though I'll wager that in most cases they wouldn't be deserving of ours. So let's imagine that there are rumors in this community of Babylonian rabbis that our rabbinical student had a sexual encounter with another man. In our story, the only person who is charged with investigating the details of that case, Rabbi Ami, recommends lifting the shamta when his investigation is over. And yet it's kept in place so as not to disrespect the honor of two elder rabbis and of the institution. This is a tale about fragile egos, extrajudicial processes, and institutional self-preservation. It's a tale in which for the sake of their own honor or their own ego, or even just to make it appear that their pals were in the right, those in power hold to the status quo and mutually cover for one another, regardless of fact or of the lives that they might destroy along the way. Not only that, but before this story, the Gemara spells out that an excommunication declared even by a rabbinical student for his own honor, and the Gemara says this, with no judicial process is valid. So it's not just by means of the story that we understand this, but by means of the actual stated law. We're living in a time in which we see over and over again that someone who crosses a line that is drawn by those who have power, whether it's those who have political power or those who have social power, is suddenly considered persona non grata when a, mo when a moment beforehand they were part of the fabric. If you're nodding your head right now, having seen this on the national level or on the personal level, I think there's a note of hope that as that lies at the end of the story. There's another scene that often gets left out when this story is told. And it starts with this. They brought him, the deceased rabbinical student, into the burial cave of the righteous people to be buried. And they did not accept him. Now the theme of being accepted into or rejected from a burial cave, usually by a snake who's guarding the cave, appears in a few stories in the Talmud. So this is not particularly unusual. In this case, however, they try again, this time at the cave of the judges rather than at the cave of the righteous people. So that's not quite as prestigious as the cave of the righteous people, but it's still up there. And the Talmud continues, they brought him into the cave of the judges and they accepted him. Now, the Talmud actually goes on to explain why he gets this privilege, but that's for another teaching. Um, what we get a taste of here is that even if the, in the human realm, those in power may be the ones who determine a person's status, and they do so based on their own devices and their own desires and their own biases, there's another realm in which our status does not depend on the whims of those more powerful than us. In that realm, we are fully ourselves and our status has everything to do with who we really are, regardless of what those more powerful than us may say about us or do to us. In our story, that message is relayed through the student's death and his admission into the cave of the judges. But that's a metaphor for a greater message that there is something greater and truer than the behavior of the more powerful. I could end here with that note of hope, but I wanna to return to the important question that this story raises for us in our community 
and in our country. So here's a list of questions that I think comes out of this text and that I think has everything to do with the way that we understand human dignity. How do we respond to rumors? How do we ensure fair investigations? What is a just process? What do we do to control vested interests and the egos of those in power? What happens when the judges are the friends or colleagues of the aggrieved or themselves have something at stake? How far do we go to protect appearances? And how do we assure that the penalties for a person's misdeeds or even for a person's non-misdeeds or with their just rumors are not such that they are, as Rashi explains, like the fat with which we line an oven, which is absorbed in and never comes out. Thank you.